Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at lifestyle and disease in the 20th century. In this course and up until this point, one of the most common ways that people died in the past was through infectious diseases. But with better understanding of germ theory and how infections are caused, greater action is taken to prevent it, and so it's not the killer it once was. However, that has meant that more people have survived for longer, and that's given the chance for lifestyle factors to have a greater role in their health. Just look at these two images from different ends of the 20th century, and in fact the latter one going into the 21st century. Attitudes to things like smoking have changed dramatically, because now we understand the impact of lifestyle on how we are healthy or not. One good indicator of general health is life expectancy, so let's have a look at that across the 20th century. This diagram shows how life expectancy for both men and women increased throughout the 20th century. Life expectancy for men increased by 29 years, and for women by 30 years. This can be explained by a variety of factors, including diet, lifestyle, which would include smoking and drinking, etc., treatment of disease, prevention of infection, and improved public health, and hospitals, of course. I will point out, though, that the 1910s and 1940s, and the 1940s are in fact not shown here, uh, both show a dramatic drastic decrease in the life expectancy for men. But what might explain that? Well, the simple answer is the First and Second World Wars. So we've deliberately left the 1910s and 1940s off of this diagram as they give a slightly misleading statistic. So what is the main threat to people's health in the 20th century? During the 20th century, many more causes for illness and disease were identified. One of these was smoking. It was recognised after smoking became popular in the early 20th century that about 30 or 40 years later, more and more smokers started getting heart disease, cancers and blood pressure problems. This was also linked to poverty. Drinking alcohol. Liver problems were caused, cancer, blood pressure and obesity, and also mental health difficulties. A lack of exercise. This could also lead to heart disease, obesity, poor circulation, and indeed can have uh, bad effects on mental health. And being overweight, which also leads to heart disease, stress on bones, and possibly breathing difficulties. These are related to poor diet too. This is seen as a cause of obesity. Also being underweight, malnourishment, cancers, and heart disease. Poverty can contribute to stress, poor diet, mental health, the risk of disease, and poor housing and stress itself. That can be a really big factor. This could have a, an effect on mental health, blood pressure, over and under eating, the risk of heart attack and strokes. It makes modern life seem pretty stressful, doesn't it? Well, at least we're not working in Victorian factories, I suppose. But part of the problem for us in understanding more about health is it can seem like we're being bombarded by advice about keeping healthy. However, these lifestyle factors all play a significant role in the health and potential illnesses that a person might face, so that's why we've got better access to information now. Let's have a look at some major causes of death in the 20th century. Cheerful stuff, eh? These show the changes in major causes of death between 1911 and 2011. We can see here that in 1911 heart disease was a minor contributor. It, it contributed to about 14.4% of all deaths. That rose massively to 45.1% in 1951, and it's still reasonably high at 28% in the modern era in 2011. So what might be the change here? Have a think about that as we move on. Then we will look at cancer. Only 6% of deaths in 1911 were down to cancer. This rose to 16.2% in 1951, and by 2011 it was 29%. And what about infectious diseases? There's another trend going on here too. Over a quarter of deaths in 1911 were down to infectious diseases, but that had reduced to only 4.3% by 1951 and only 0.7% in 2011. Although, of course, uh, the 2020 COVID pandemic would show a different slant on that, I'm sure. So what's going on here? Well, if we start with infectious diseases, think about how infectious diseases have been fought over the course of the 20th century. People now understand germs and increasingly viruses too. Think about the introduction of medicines like penicillin. That means that whereas people might have died from infectious disease in the past, they can now ha either prevent that infection happening or treat it if it occurs. That explains the dramatic decrease. I'm going to cover cancer last, so we'll go over to heart disease now. The massive rate of heart disease in 19, the 1950s may well be down to how common smoking was in the years leading up to that. 
as smoking became less and less common, people understood the risks and also people's diet uh, improved, although obviously there are still lots of modern problems with diet too, then we can see that heart disease has reduced, but not down to the levels that it was in 1911. Let's not forget as well that in 1911, people tended to be more physically active both in work and leisure, but not necessarily for the reasons that you might expect. Remember, a lot of jobs were far more physical in 1911, so it wasn't just that everyone was going to the gym. And lastly, with cancer. Well, let's look at this logically. Yes, some, sometimes cancer is caused by lifestyle factors, and we will cover that later on. But let's bear in mind the number of people who died of things like infectious diseases and heart disease previously. Fewer people are now dying of those things, which means people are living longer. That's really good news. However, by living longer, we're also increasing our risk of getting cancer in the end. So some of the people who get cancer in this diagram would have in the past died of an infectious disease instead. And so it's actually good news that they're living longer. It does show us though that cancer is still one of the big health challenges that we need to defeat. And speaking of the 21st century, we're not there yet, but much progress has been made. So how do we prevent infectious diseases now? And that would explain that massive drop from 1911. Well, here we can see a series of vaccines that have been introduced. But do bear in mind that the tuberculosis vaccine in 1906 was not wholly um, effective. So when Edward Jenner invented his smallpox vaccination, many people refused to believe him and even mocked him for his work. However, by the 20th century, a majority of public opinion was in support of vaccinations, especially for children, as a way of preventing and controlling infectious diseases. For the most of human history, infectious disease has been the biggest killer. Since widespread vaccination, this is no longer the case. That begs the question then, what is? In developed countries especially, illness caused by lifestyle is now a leading cause of mortality or death. Remember, the DNA breakthrough opened the door to preventing and diagnosing genetic illnesses people are born with. But what about illnesses caused by how people live their lives? Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with the breakthrough about DNA, I've got a rapid revision video on that too. Many of the illnesses caused by lifestyle factors are from choice, people making a decision to live in a certain way. This might include smoking, drinking alcohol, not exercising enough or eating unhealthily. While people have the freedom to make their own choices, the government has launched many different prevention campaigns to try and prevent illnesses created by lifestyle choices. And a selection of those from around the country and around the world can be seen uh, at the bottom of the screen here. So advice on not smoking around children, staying active and eating well, not smoking and its links to um, cancer if you do, and also the dangers of alcohol, which has been a particular focus for the Scottish government. When it comes to understanding diseases caused by lifestyle, we're going to have a look at a case study now, lung cancer. 150 years ago, lung cancer was extremely rare. Today, though, over 40,000 people are diagnosed with it each year. Nearly 90% of all cases are the result of smoking or passive smoking, that is, taking in smoke that other people are breathing out. Lung cancer is extremely difficult to diagnose in its early stages, meaning it's very difficult to prevent from developing or spreading through the body once it does. Only 10% of those with lung cancer live for more than five years, compared to survival rates for other cancers, where 50% live for at least 10 years. So how are people trying to combat lung cancer? Well, one is immunotherapy. This boosts the immune system to stop the cancer from growing. Radiotherapy is also tried. This uses radiation to kill cancer cells. Techniques have improved to target cancers more precisely and therefore cause less damage to the rest of the body. Surgery can be used as well. This has been used since the 1930s, but it's often too dangerous due to other smoking related health problems such as blood pressure and heart disease. However, new techniques have less impact on the body and a quicker recovery time. And then there's chemotherapy, the use of chemicals. This is used if therapy, radiotherapy is unsuccessful. It involves using powerful chemical medicines to attack the cancer cells, but it can have serious side effects, which is why it is not always used. So we've got different treatments to try and fight lung cancer, but ultimately the statistics would suggest that if people didn't smoke, we wouldn't have to use them so often anyway. So what has progress been like over the course of the 20th century? And what can we infer from this graph? In this graph, we can see the average life expectancy for men and for women going from the Middle Ages right up to the present day, or very near to it anyway. What can we infer from this? 
Well, I'm going to give you some options and you can decide which one best reflects what you see in the graph. Which of these statements best reflects the graph? Medicine has improved rapidly during the 1900s. Medicine has improved steadily during the 1900s. Medicine has improved slowly during the 1900s. But which factors might explain why women's life expectancy has overtaken men's since 1900? If you want to ponder that for a moment, you can pause the video here. If not, I'll go on to the explanations. Well, the statement that best reflects what we see in the graph is absolutely that medicine has improved rapidly during the 1900s. That's why that graph seems to climb so very rapidly when we get up to the end stages of it. Life expectancy was pretty steady throughout the Middle Ages, through into the Renaissance and into the start of the uh, industrial period too, because actually there hadn't been many breakthroughs which really related to people's health and well-being and fighting disease. There had been more breakthroughs when it came to understanding. However, after germ theory and with all the new medicines and techniques that were developed throughout the 20th century, things like infectious diseases were no longer the threat that they once were. So we can see there's been this exponential or rapid growth in life expectancy from the middle of the 19th century right through to the present day. That's got to be good news. But what about the case of women? Well, it's true to say that women's life expectancy has improved partly as a result of fewer younger women dying in childbirth. Childbirth has been dangerous for as long as human history. But there is evidence to suggest that in the Middle Ages, um, the uh, safety of the mother was taken more into account than the safety of the child, which is tragic in and of itself. And that trend started to change as people uh, tended to save the child at the expense of the mother. But modern medicine and hospitals, for example, have meant that childbirth has never been safer. And that might go some way to explaining why women's life expectancy has improved so much. Anyway, don't quote me on that because the evidence is a little bit contradictory at times, but it's an interesting reflection to have. Some final points then. For the vast majority of human history, the biggest killer has been infectious disease. As the understanding of and treatment of infectious disease improved after the mid 19th century, remember 1861 with germ theory, life expectancy increased. However, as people age, they are more susceptible to lifestyle related illnesses that in the developed world have overtaken infectious disease as the biggest cause of death. This includes smoker related cancers, obesity related illnesses and alcohol related illnesses. Throughout the 20th century and up to today, governments focus more attention on educating people about lifestyle choices and avoiding illness. And that makes sense. If they avoid illness, it saves the government money when it comes to socialised healthcare systems like the NHS. And so it's, there's an incentive for both governments and us as individuals to look after our health. So I hope that doesn't sound too, too preachy. I don't mean it to, but we're simply looking at the lifestyle impact on health in the 20th century and through to the present day. I hope the video has been useful to you. If it has, please like the video and you can subscribe to the channel for more. But in the meantime, I'll simply say and really mean this time, good health.